people just don't have an understanding or a grasp of like what is happening but like fundamentally like what are these models trying to do and and how do they kind of respond to certain things like this is not anything anyone's ever had experience with before and so coming in like we're not just teaching them how to use our product we're trying to teach them like fundamentally here's even like what ai generated content means you're listening to gradient descent a show about machine learning in the real world and i'm your host lucas bewald this is an interview with dave rogan moser the ceo of jasper ai and saad ansari the head of ai at jasper ai jasper is one of the most exciting breakout successes in text generation right now and a pioneer in using prompt engineering to build a successful business. This is a really interesting interview, both about entrepreneurship and applied machine learning, and also technical details around large language models and the future of how prompt engineering will work. I learned a lot from this interview and I hope you enjoy it. Well, why don't we start a little differently? I was thinking this is what I what I would need as a ML researcher, which is mostly our audience. Um, could you explain how a marketer would use Jasper and what they would get out of it and and maybe even get concrete about what people love so much about it cuz you know you mentioned that people have a real palpable excitement about using the product like why why is that happening yeah marketers have a lot of content to create and most of them would create infinite amounts of it you know so nobody's ever like has enough blog posts. Nobody has enough. I mean, at some level, you probably have enough to like add creative, but like you run a bunch of tests and all of a sudden a week later, like everybody like sits down and they write all this stuff and then like they test it. And a week later, they're like out of things to test. And they're like, they go six months without ever testing like another headline again for their Facebook ad. And so, you know, the only way to do this is, has been just through manpower. I'm just, you know, trying to hire more people and dedicate more time to it. And, and, you know, with marketing it's, it's such a thing that like a little bit better headline can be the difference between successfully and profitably spending you know a hundred million dollars on ads or uh spending three million and having to shut the whole thing down so you know a lot of this is like pretty thin margins between a whole campaign working really well and uh it never getting off the ground at all and so um yeah, there's just so much at stake and, and so much value to add there. And, and you know, marketers, you know, think highly of themselves. They, you know, my writing's different and all of those things. And and it is, you know, for a lot of them. But I think when they saw Jasper, you know, the fact that it was pretty good, in some cases better than them, and it could do it in an instant. And, um, you know, it kind of freed them up to go from like the marketer that has to stare at the blank page and do it themselves to now a little bit more of like the, the managing editor. Like uh, Jasper will give me all the the raw materials here and he'll give me the first draft and I can pick and choose and assemble and all that stuff. But it just it kind of moves everyone up a level there. And so um, that's what marketers use Jasper for. You know, some of it's um, just high volume stuff that just need to create a lot of it. Some of it is... Um, you know, creating, yeah, great content that's made better than you would already create. Um, you know, well, all of it is is marketers um, trying to just get an edge and just get out a little bit better content, a little bit more content faster. And I guess you were one of the first companies to really make commercial use of large language models. Could could you talk about what that process looks like? Like, how do you how do you make the large language model into something that people are actually willing to pay pay real money for? Well, I think the first thing is you've got to know a customer base and and know it really deeply. And that's, I think, always been our secret. secret. It's like, I just know the customer base super deeply. I am the customer. I've sold a lot of stuff to them before. They're my friends. They're our community. Like, it's just like, it's just, I'm so in it. And I'm always looking for ways, you know, to make, you know, their lives easier, make my own life easier. I think a lot of people just aren't connected to any sort of like end user in any meaningful way. And I remember I would like, you know, I joined the OpenAI Slack community back in the day. And like the day I got the credential, I was like, you know, like I am Thanos here. I'm like, this is like ultimate power. And I get in there and like, I'm the only one talking about like, 
building something that like people would want. Like literally, like the there's like a thousand people in there, and they're all like translating to like Declaration of Independence into like Elvish, and then back out into like album art. And I'm just like, this is cool, but like like literally, no one's talking about like like letting like regular people like use this stuff. And, and it was confusing to me, you know, still maybe perhaps confusing, you know, to me. Um, I think it was just a huge market for like, Hey, like taking this stuff and like making it useful and solving some specific problem in some way. Um, but I think like that's where it started for us was just like, Hey, like we met this tool. Uh, I knew deeply like what we wanted. And, and I felt like I knew like the outputs that like would get customers excited and they would get me excited about. Um, so I think early days, it was just like playing them. I didn't know anything about prompting or, you know, I'd love to see my first prompts and they were just probably nothing. Um, and I just kind of like dove in for like a week and just started like really crafting these things like one by one and messed around with it all. And, you know, I'm sure saw it has replaced everything I've done at this point now. Uh, but early days, it was just a lot of like testing out. I think everyone was like learning, um, you know, what to, what to do there, but really, I just kept coming back to like the customer. Like I care about all the settings and all the prompts and like all that is just a byproduct of like, we've got this problem that needs solving. Uh, and if this tool can solve it, then like, let's try it. And is the problem somehow more specific than just, you know, write me some content on this topic? Like how, how do you think about that? Like, I, again, I'm, I'm not a marketer. So kind of like walk me through like what they're, what they're thinking or, or even like, maybe could you, could you point me to like a, you know, specific marketer that, that works with you and tell me how they think about the, the content that they get. Let's use like blog posts, probably our most popular, um, use case. I mean, you search for something, you know, on Google that there's only going to be 10 results that pop up on the first page. So, you know, your blog post that you write has to be better than quite literally millions of blog posts that could kind of surface and be somewhat, you know, there. So it's like, you know, you gotta be in the top 10, but then even past that, like you really gotta be like the top two. You know, this is pretty like, you know, a pretty big fall off, you know, even if you scroll past the top, you know, two or three there. And so, you know, it's not just about getting a blog post out, which is maybe what kind of earlier models could do. It's about getting a really good blog post out. And it's really gotta win in this marketplace of of ideas. It's gotta be compelling. It's gotta be engaged. It's gotta be factual. It's gotta be helpful. It's gotta be written by somebody that deeply knows the audience. And so just like clicking compose, you know, on some large language model, you know, it's like it's not gonna be enough. It's not gonna be enough to win, particularly that other people have that. And so I think you know, our customers, like they want really high quality content. And and I always challenge them. I'm like, don't even bother writing like low quality content. Like this isn't some article spinner. Uh, one, I just don't feel good about building that kind of product. But two, like it's just not going to work for marketers. Like it's just not going to get clicks. It's not going to rank on Google. It's not going to get people excited when they come to your landing page if it's just kind of filler stuff. And so I think from the beginning, we've always said, hey, like we're here for like high quality content. And the degree that we can help people produce that, you know, we will, like, that's going to be a big part of our focus, um, as opposed to like just an article spinner that just spins out tons of tons and tons of stuff. It's just not going to stand up and actually like produce the ROI that, you know, marketers want. And I guess like my experience of just working with GPT-3 is it's like an impressive product for sure, but I don't think I get what I would consider high quality blog posts out of it when I just sort of, you know, mess around with it. Like, can you talk about like how you, how you actually got it to deliver high quality content? Like, is there kind of a human in the loop here that's like tweaking it or what's the, what's the process like? Yeah. Well, you certainly, even in Jasper can't just go and click a button and get a high quality blog post out now. So, I mean, we really talk a lot about the customers like, Hey, it's a dance, you know, it's like Jasper's there to help give you, you know, I might start with blog post titles or blog post topics. I just forgive me 10 blog post ideas around this topic. Okay. That's a pretty good one. You know, that, that helps me start off in a better spot. You know, Jasper, give me 10 titles, you know, about that topic. Okay, cool. Those are pretty cool. Okay. You know, Jasper, give me an outline that I can start to work off of here. Uh, that first one, you know, stinks, you know, okay, give me three more outlines. And so you're basically like going back and forth with Jasper to like help assemble it. And like, if you don't know what a good blog post is, you're going to be in trouble. If you don't um, know what your reader might, 
Like if you don't really know what your reader wants, you're going to be in trouble because Jasper is not going to to know all that. But you know, what I think Jasper does do a great job of is if you kind of have, if you are able to direct it, you're able to help piece that together. Like you can assemble a really great blog post. Um, some of it will be you, some of it will be steering, you know, the output there. Um, but like, it's just using a variety of different tools to do that. And you can get some really, really, really high quality content. That's really remarkable. And that readers really want, um, but it is going to take, you know, yeah, human in the loop, you know, doing that. So that's kind of happening there. And then like our team in the background is, you know, testing out all different models that, you know, produce blog posts best. And, and there's all different prompts that produce, you know, different types of blog posts. And should we have kind of one tool that creates a general blog post or they're actually five types of blog posts and we need five different models each one a little bit more specific to a listicle or an informational blog post or whatever um i think we're trying to like do all of that behind the scenes and and like simplify that for the user uh and just like turn it into this magical experience that they can just show up and start getting to work and like you know our goal is that the uh, software would kind of become invisible and you were the first person doing the prompt engineering is that right like a, on, on day one me. of the product. So yeah, what did you learn? Me. Help me t- teach me how to do prompt engineering. What are the first couple of things that you figured out when you were just messing around with it? Oh man. You know, I mean, I just didn't know anything. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. First I'm probably just, you know, first I was probably treating like, you know, these instruct models where it's like, you know, write a blog post for me. And it's just like, write a blog post for me, write a blog post for me, write a blog post for me, write a blog post for me. Okay, cool. Like, what's happening here. Okay. And there's patterns and it's trying to figure out what I want. And, you know, all of that, you know, I think particularly like early days, we still get a lot of benefit from this is, you know, the, the examples that we would give it, you know, for like, you know, few shot outputs, like really were important. And I felt like a lot of our competitors, you know, were marketers. So we're just probably like sticking, I mean, I don't really know what any of them are doing, but like, we're just sticking like, you know, whatever, like decent examples in there. And I had a really high bar and, and I was able to use examples that I knew for a fact, like converted really well on Facebook, right? I knew for a fact performed really well there. And so we just always use stuff that was proven in the market to like start to steer and give examples there. Um, and so we'd get like really, I'd say like highly opinionated, but really high quality outputs, you know, out of it there. Um, but yeah, it was just me like, you know, reading every doc I could, there like weren't that many docs back then and just talking to everybody and like, what's top P mean? And you know, all of these things, I just had no idea, but I knew, I knew, like, I knew the output I was trying to get to. And like, I wouldn't stop until like, it was like, man, like that is really good. And I would really use that. And I think like, that's really what's, that's probably like, what's harder, I suppose, than like figuring out what like top P really does. What does top P do? What is that? Oh gosh. I was just like hoping you were going to ask me. <laughs> Sorry. <What that> means. <laughs> I got, I got, we got people here now. We got Saad that can, uh, can do all that stuff. But you know, let, uh, if you're listening, let my, uh, my ignorance on top P go to show you where I think the real value lies here. It's, uh, it, it, it's outside or in addition to knowing what all the little things do, it's like, what is it useful for? And like, wh- where does this like really play a role in society? Well, so when you think about hiring a prompt engineer, then what do you look for? Is it domain expertise in, marketing and, and content and and i guess what else would you ask me if i showed up um interviewing for being a, a prompt engineer yeah i think for us you know i look first and foremost for a uh a, an understanding of the customer or at least a willingness and desire to understand the customer and an empathy for the customer that like i really do want like we, we have people that apply that like really want to do AI. And they're like, I really want to do AI. I don't want to be a cutting edge company and we want to generative AI is so cool and all that. And like, that's fine. But if it's just that, I think you're going to struggle here. Like I want it to be, I really want to use AI. I love the customer base. I can see the problem. I can articulate the problem that like we're working on here. And man, AI happens to be a really great fit there. And I'm excited to, to kind of find what else really helps solve that problem. Like that's really what I'm looking for uh, as opposed to just, I just want to do AI. Um, and so I think when, yeah, when I think about like a prompt engineer, yeah, like we got away with like for a long time without anyone that like really knew AI, I would say. 
um, we were technical and we could hack it and we were fine tuning models. We were doing, you know, still doing some, some fancy stuff, but it wasn't like we're like doing anything that would blow anyone's minds. Um, but it still just kind of worked. And so I, I really, again, going back to that, I think like kind of generating prompts and working on that, like starting with like a deep understanding of the customer, like we'll get you so, so far. Well, I mean, I, I think you're kind of the, the poster child for, prompt engineering and certainly some people think that machine learning kind of goes away or takes a back seat in the sense of of training models and there's sort of this new role of of prompt engineer that kind of uses these models for some um purpose you know my background is in machine learning but i'm certainly not um i'm open-minded to, to different paths that the the industry could take like do you think that in your world machine learning technical ability even matters at all do you try to hire machine learning people themselves i think it does matter i think a lot of this stuff over a long enough time horizon like you know gets commoditized and it matters i don't know if less the things that used to matter technically like are probably like kind of solve you know much more now and so no i mean you know we've got a really strong um internal ai team you know that's full of like really smart you know what i would call it the ai the AI people, you know, Assad's putting together, you know, an awesome team there. And so like, we want to have a ton of those people that can just help us can develop modes and develop IP and again, solve customers problems, you know, in a deep way. Um, and so I think it, I think it does matter. I think we'll always have that. And like, I want to have a 500 person, you know, team full of ML engineers and AI people doing all of that. Um, but I don't want to be maybe like driven by that like that's always like a byproduct of like the thing that we're trying to do uh and, and if we can solve customers problems using all that stuff then like we're so much better off for it it definitely gives us an advantage i don't know Saad, do you have any do you have any thoughts on there you want to add in no i i totally agree um you know essentially like what we're, what we're asking is the customer wants something and the customer has a vision maybe or maybe they're trying to discover a new idea and then there's like this ideal output out there somewhere that would make them happy and delight them and give them a lot of value. Um, between like their input and then the ideal output for them, there's like there's like choosing the right AI, the AI system. And it's not necessarily one model. It could be like a number of models. And I think that's where like the AI team plays a role. Like what is the right system? What is the right base? And I, I think you're right as well. Prompt engineering is going to play a huge role. Um, you know, and as Dave said, like, like Dave's like a perfect prompt engineer and is somebody who loves the customer and is willing to iterate like through n number of cycles to find that right you know, that, you know, that the right prompt, um, I, you know, just an interesting point there as well. There's this idea of like expertise. An expert is like somebody who's like learned something and knows it from experience. I think one of the really interesting and fun things about a lot of these models is that even the people who made them are experts on them. Like it often happens like an R and D center will come up and give us a model and we have to test it. And they'll tell us like all these things about the model. And then like within like a few minutes of us testing it, we've already like falsified like a lot of those assumptions. Nobody's an expert in like prompt engineering. It just takes like a love of the end use and the customer and the product and just willing to be patient with it. I guess one of the things that seems like it might be hard in putting myself in your shoes is actually quantifying if your models are improving over time. Like, I guess, is there some way that you know, even Dave, that, you know, as you, as you iterate that they're better besides just sort of eyeballing the, the content that's getting produced? Yeah, early days, it was eyeballing. And it was, yeah, sometimes we'd kind of like in Slack, just trying to like pop in two screenshots. Hey, everybody vote on one of these. Which one do you think is better? But again, I, all this had happened in my head a lot where it's like I would just kind of keep cycling until I, like, I could feel it kind of getting better just to my own expertise there. And it was nothing like scientific. And even, you know, a lot of stuff we didn't test. And it's like, you know, once I kind of found uh, the right you know, setting on something. I probably wouldn't even like test around and find the optimal one. It was just like locally, like pretty good. Um, and then, yeah, we'd release it, you know, to customers. And I think, you know, kind of, you know, anecdotally, you know, they'd share feedback, like whether stuff was, in, you know, getting better or worse. Um, we sort of track things like, are they favoriting it? Um, are they copying it to their clipboard? You know, was a signal that was even maybe stronger than favoriting it. Um, you know, and then are they kind of using it, you know, other places in the product? We sort of like track those as like real signals there. It is funny, you know, especially early days, it probably happens now, but 
a lot of people's perception can like really sway a whole community. And so, you know, we'd have somebody complain about a template, you know, and they'd say this, some, something changed in the last five hours. That's totally different. It's way worse. Please revert it. You know, Davis is getting worse. So you get a bunch of like, yeah, something changed, something changed. Like to the best of my knowledge, nothing had changed. Nobody was touching that. Like nothing shipped, like nothing happened. But like people just kind of pile on that as like, you know, kind of a way to like highlight, you know, maybe their frustrations with it. And the same thing reversed. People would be like, hey, anybody noticed that like the paragraph generator is like way better now? Uh, and yeah, you know, again, I've had it happen since you know, before. They have all these people kind of piling on, like, it's so much better. I love it. Thank you for all you guys do. And so I think companies can get a lot of mileage over uh, out of like frequent improvements and like having a culture of improving because everyone just kind of always assumes everything is improving, like all over the place. Like you get the benefit of the doubt over things like you haven't even touched. Like, man, everything's just getting so much better all the time because like they've come to see that like that's a general theme in our company. And then if we kind of slow down and stop, like, again, I think like it atrophies, like we are like the like customer trust that erodes. They start thinking like more stuff is worse than like it really is there. So it, it is hard to quantify, but a lot of it is just customers sometimes just kind of feeling like things are getting better and like they're being heard and like they're seeing improvements there and they'll give you like a ton of benefit of the doubt from that. Do you feel like you benefit from improvements in GPT-3? Like I've heard different things from other people. Some people seem to feel like GP3 will launch a new thing and it'll kind of break all the prompts. Other people tell me that, you know, it's actually like, you know, much better than, than it used to be. What, what's your experience like? Yeah, I think we get benefits. And even like I tell our team, you know, whatever, let, let's, let's do a lot of our own stuff and have our own IP. But like, if OpenAI is going to just do all this free work and then just push it to like, you know, some API endpoint, and then now you've got all this new functionality, like that takes us. 20 minutes to like test it and like implement it. Like let's use that. It's like, let's always be sure that we're testing all this new stuff that they've got 200 people building for us. Uh, and, and not kind of like, you know, just rely on our own, our own stuff. And so, you know, it's hit or miss. It's not like everything that they kind of roll out is like better. Um, we AB test, I think pretty much like every new like model and update, you know, that they kind of make, um, even, you know, we'll fine tune our own models and it's like, you know, definitely hit or miss, like whether those are even better. Um, and so, yeah, so even like you got some of the best people in the world working on this and, and they'll be like super excited about some model we'll test it. Like this is actually performing worse like across the board. Uh, we're not going to roll this thing out there. So it, it is interesting how, how, that, how that all works, but we definitely try to use all the stuff that they release. Do you find fine tuning useful? Again, some people say that prompt engineering makes fine tuning obsolete. What, what's your opinion right now? It's uh, November 7th, 2022. What's, what's the... Yeah, yeah. This will be obsolete no, November 8th. I mean, yeah, yeah. generally, um, we find it helpful. I mean, you know, I think a lot of what I worry about in this space or try to allocate, like, like it's allocating like resources correctly here where you're not doing all of this work that then just gets obsolete, like, out of the blue and it's like oh we just spent all this time fine-tuning all these models and oh this like new model makes fine-tuning obsolete or yeah. you know th that is like so much of what we're trying to do is just like figure like what like where's our space like where's our special secret sauce that we can go and implement there so yes yeah, so, i mean we've got you know different fine-tuned models running um but even as i say that i'm thinking like man like you know i don't know when the last time we tested just a new model that might very well be better than like an old fine-tuned model you know um, this is stuff changed so fast. I think it's a lot of what we think through is just like being sure we always like going back to the whole, the whole system and like updating with new stuff and testing it with new stuff. Okay. Another question is probably not going to age well, but I'm curious your like current take as far as you can tell me is how you think about the different LLMs out there. Like, I think you're famously using GPT-3, but I'm sure you've tried Bloom and, and maybe other ones. Like what, what do you think about all the, the LLMs out there? Yeah, we use GPT-3, you know, primarily and not exclusively. You know, we've got other stuff going on and we're always testing new stuff there. You know, it's funny, you know, you kind of like, I think I get down and this is almost like an Android Apple conversation. We're like, you get down into like the weeds and like, you know, people that really are the know, like, oh yeah, GPT-3, you know, not even top five anymore. And I've heard people say stuff like that. No, this one's better, this one's better, this one's better. 
And I'm like, I just don't see that like bubbling up to being like a more user friendly model or really doing things. So I still feel like GPT three, from my perspective, is generally far better than a lot that's out there. I don't doubt that, and you know, we've seen this ourselves too. It's like there's things that can do specific things better. But I think like by and large, like GPT three still reigns supreme in my mind, and most people producing high quality content, you know, or using that, um, primarily. So I'd say, I don't know, Saad, you, what do you think? Or even Lucas, say, what, what kind of your thoughts? Have you seen that? So I'm, there's, I'm always asking people this question, like what else is out there? What are you seeing? And I think a lot of people that just kind of really know, they're like, ah, you know, GPT-3 is pretty dang good. Yeah. You know, like this is almost like a puzzle of three black boxes. So you have the black box of like, what does the customer want? The black box of what do the models do? And then the black box of like everything in the middle and like, what are we going to do about all that stuff? Um, you know, I think customers want different things, like in for you know for different use cases. Like for for blog posts, maybe they want to have something that's like more semantically complex. The 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 language is richer. If they're doing product descriptions, maybe they want to make sure the facts are preserved and it's like more domain specific, and that it's able to like speak to you know it's able to speak to and and sustain like the the data and the specifications that was in their initial product descriptions. Like what we're finding is that different models have trade offs. So typically. When you increase in like semantic complexity, you're also that the same processes which get, get you that also get you to break down facts. And it gets better at like representing what looks like facts, but it might actually be lying way better. And so you don't even like you can't even tell it's is it's like representing facts in a false way. Similarly, those models are like a little bit more literal, but they're not able to be very semantically complex or speak like Shakespeare. GPT three is is great, but it wasn't trained on like a lot of foreign languages, whereas Bloom was. And so I think, you know, I think ultimately it's about what does the customer want for that specific use case? And then what is the best way to get there? Like what are the approaches and processes? And it's not necessarily one model all the time. Maybe it can be a combination of models, like an adapter model with a with a base model. And then how do you kind of tie together those initial models? It's almost like a menu of options to get the best effect, the best output for the, the highest efficiency. So so I think it's more of like a puzzle piece. And like you'll always have these three variables you're dealing with. Well, sure. But okay, like at this moment, is there are there, is there another model that you like genuinely use or is there like, a, um, you know, like a number two that you would, that you would point to other than, than GPT-3? P5 is really interesting for like some of its instruct capabilities and its ability to be fine tuned for very specific things. And indeed, like you could say there's a hypothesis that a really good AI architecture will always have like two things, like a really generalized model that's powerful in probably semantics, which is like one half, of, you know, the thing about language. And then a secondary model is either really good at, at that instruction, like specific instruct, or at like some sort of like fact, you know, fact adaptation. Um, because it's it's like one model will become specifically more complex at the cost of sustaining facts, whereas another model can kind of preserve facts at the cost of not being the most semantically complex one. So this is a hypothesis. Like we'll think we'll probably end up finding a lot of these different pairs to get the best of both worlds. Interesting. I guess maybe overall at this moment, November 7th, 2022, how, do you have a characterization in your mind of what large language models can do and, and can't do? Like where, where do you feel like the limit is? Is there a type of content that you feel like you couldn't create well, given, given the current state of things that you might be able to do in, in 2023 or 2024? I can bubble up like a few big customer complaints, you know, perhaps the biggest one is factuality and, you know, how to, it'd be one thing to know that like, you know, it'd be one thing if they just always had incorrect facts and then you could see it, then you see a fact and then you go correct, it. but it kind of lulls you to sleep. It's like, man, like it's, it knows a lot and you, you all of a sudden start trusting everything. And then it's like, you know, you don't want to look up every fact because you've seen four that are totally right, but then it'll just say, the opposite. Like I remember one time I was asking like who won the uh who won the twenty twenty one Super Bowl? And it was like, you know, uh I forget what it was. It was basically the right team it was the right teams, the right score, the right location, the right date. I looked all that up, but it actually switched the team. So it wow. team that lost, it set one. And it's just he like lulls you to sleep. It all like looks pretty good and probably kind of passed the like sniff test. And then you realize, oh man, I just like, you know, shipped the like exact wrong answer. And so I think like, that's just a big thing that, you know, we've got to figure out 
how to uh, control for, how to identify, and how to um, how to be just a little more truthful, I suppose. Another one is just obviously, yeah, like getting it to to follow instructions. You know, it can tend to like repeat itself. You know, if it hasn't quite picked up the pattern or the instruction, you know, it just thinks you want it to say the same thing over and over again. And then, you know, if our customers kind of set that pattern, you know, let's say you, you do it twice and then you like keep trying to write and it's like, so now it's going to do it even more. And then like you just reinforce this, like it spirals out where it's like, well, why is it always saying the same thing over and over? Things so you kind of set the pattern, you know, at the beginning, you know, that, that makes you kind of do that. Or, you know, you misspell one word in, in, a, in, a, in an intro paragraph of a blog post and then you realize that like Jasper misspells it the entire way. And you're just like, what is happening? Here? Like, it's like a common word. It's like, well, like you kind of misspelled it. And so kind of Jasper thinks that's how you want the word to be spelled. So um, there's definitely a lot of just like steering, you know, content and teaching people. I also think like people just don't have an understanding or a grasp of like what is happening. But like fundamentally, like what are these models trying to do? And, and how do they kind of respond to certain things? Like this is not anything anyone's ever had experience with before and so coming in like we're not just teaching them how to use our product we're trying to teach them like fundamentally here's even like what ai generated content means and here's the limitations of these kinds of models and here's what they're really good at like we're trying to teach all of them that in a in a very like simple way so have you seen anything that you feel like yeah we can't so, do yeah. so so like um, just just the way we evaluate and think about models is you you have an x y axis you have semantic complexity and then you have like domain fit which has a lot of different features like factuality then you have like a, a bunch of di additional capabilities like multilingualism and so on um, and like we also pay like a lot of attention to instruct can the customers get what they want out of it in terms of like semantic complexity like I think it can it can probably end up doing everything at the end of the day like there there was this article about does Moore's law apply to generative AI and I think it kind of does but not really it applies for semantic complexity like really well but unlike Moore's law which like kind of continues on forever like there's like there's like it's like a diminishing return so eventually you'll start like hitting an asymptote and kind of like level off because like, what does it mean to become like infinitely good at semantics or like language because like, humans have a limit like you can't really beat that um because like what it, what would it even mean for like the customer going above that so i think it'll actually get really good um for semantics i think there's a lot of limit around like domain fit factuality and um it's actually there's actually an aspect of it that kind of worries me a little bit uh, like I, I would really, I would really be worried if like anybody using a generative model started using it to like get advice, like legal advice or medical advice. And it kind of speaks to what, what, what Dave was saying about factuality. It's actually getting better at lying. So like, it looks like it's more factual. It'll like, if you ask it for legal advice, some of these models can like cite like legal papers and like even come up with like fake court cases, but it's like totally made up. So, so it's actually like, not just a limitation, but, but like almost at risk and, you know, I think our community like is like really wise to like not use it for that. But you'll see this kind of get better and worse at the same time. Like it'll get better at like representing citations like um, in a, in a really strange way. Um, I think for domain fit and factuality, like we actually have the perfect tool for factuality. We've always had it for decades. It's a like copy and paste. And so the question is, is like, is there is there if we want to increase factuality, like are we able to bring in a database that has the facts that the user cares about? And then have a stupid model, like I call it stupid factual, like you have stupid factuality, smart factuality, and false factuality. Can we like replicate stupid factuality with one model and then have another model be semantically complex and bring the best of both, you know, to, to you know, to, um, to the user? So I think the limitations are around factuality, as Dave said. I think everything else, though, like there's like, you know, in a way, it's not the sky, it's not that the sky is the limit, but like the users are the limit. Like we'll be able to accomplish what a lot of humans can accomplish in the rules in our realms, realms of language and, and also semantics when you say semantic complexity can you give me an example of like what you mean like what would be a very like semantically complex thing to say yeah it, let's do like two examples of one being a tweet and then one being like the longest form possible so like a tweet if you say like a sentence like the dog barked or, or like or like uh uh like let's just say you said like the, like a sentence like the dog the dog barks and you say the dog likes Jurassic Park and you say the dog likes Jurassic Bark like the last one is a pun for the model to know that's like hey write me a funny joke about a dog like it would have to know that like bark and dog is related it would have to know that um Jurassic Park was a movie and that you can replace park with bark there's like a lot of like semantic complexity going into that sentence you're getting like a higher density of meaning like within within shorter tokens or word count whereas the first sentence is like it's almost the same word length but it's like less complex 
So semantic complexity is the ability for it to have like different layers of meaning, like within a given space. In, in terms of like the longest form, like think about like a play by a play or something by Lin Manuel Miranda. You have like questions of plot where you're getting like the end of the the end of the play to reference something in the beginning of the play or different paragraphs referring to each other, and you get like these like like. If, you know, if you imagine like the words being linked to each other, it's like you have more links between words and between paragraphs. Like that's like semantic complexity. It's like more dimensions to it. Um, and you, you know, insofar as like these natural, these like LLMs or large language models are predicting the next word in like a, you know in a in a string of tokens, you, you can see why it's hard for them to accomplish this. But at the same time, why they mathematically can end up doing so. It's interesting. I, I feel like I've spent a little more time with Dolly, maybe because my daughter loves um dolly and i feel like there we have such basic problems like we try to get it to draw the mom with black hair instead of like blonde hair and it, it drives you know my daughter nuts and, and actually my wife nuts too and, and that just seems like such basic um you know kind of semantic understanding of, of a sentence like it'll often take a different person in the scene that we're trying to describe and and give them blonde hair instead of the mom or give them black hair instead of the mom uh, i'm curious like do you think there's something different about uh, image generation that because it doesn't seem like it has very much understanding of of what I'm asking at least in that domain? I think image gener generation is interesting, and obviously, like it being so visual and instant that it's really easy to synthesize like the whole thing in half a second. You know, where I think you know, if you had Jasper write a blog post, it's like ah, like is this a good blog post? Like, is it what I wanted? Like, it's gonna take me like two minutes to like figure that out like do all of that so there's something just like it, it, i'm sure there's a lot of weird stuff happening and obviously like text generation been around longer than image generation so this you know image generation will probably be super easy and awesome in a year or like 72 hours um i'm sure there's there's weird stuff happening that's just harder to see it's harder to see that oh it, it gave the wrong hair color to the wrong person or it gave the wrong conclusion to this thing you know that i thought it did there and also do like image generation, you know, you know, you could say, yeah, like, don't give this car, like, don't paint this car pink. Like, what's it going to do? It's going to like paint the car pink. Cause like, it doesn't like know that like don't and pink are like tied there. And so it's, it still feels, I think image generation prompting still feels like much more dumb than text generation. And uh, I assume it's just kind of like the state of the technology being earlier as opposed to maybe something being more complex there, but I could be wrong. Interesting. I'm I'm curious. Um, and I'm you know I'm not here to grill you at all on your on your business model, but I I feel like I have to ask like you know you made this awesome business. It sounds like in like a few weeks of effort at at first, and it kind of just took off. Like, how do you think about defending your business? Like, don't you worry that someone might come along with a similar, um, you know, approach, or maybe they find something that's like a little bit, you know, better somehow in such a fast moving space? Like, how do you how do you stay ahead of that? Well, I don't think we made an awesome business in a few weeks. I think we made a crappy MVP for how to do Facebook ads in a few weeks, you know, and then I've spent, uh, you know, every day since then building out, you know, all the other parts of a, of a scalable, repeatable business. But no, it's a, it's a super valid question. And I think, you know, I spent a lot of time just thinking about moats over the last 18 months like what's real what's not real so looking at the b2b companies you know like where like where are really moats I mean, obviously you've got people with people with like most to think you know maybe network effects or maybe you know you think uber going into a city or you think amazon having warehouses everywhere you know things that are like so structurally like obvious but then you also take maybe like hubspot you know, or maybe Adobe. It's like, what's the moat there? It's like, I don't know. Like, it's like, they kind of like knew a customer and they built a good team and they had good culture and they, you know, maybe got a little lucky and they kept executing like over and over. They had a second product, a third product, a fourth product. I think like in B2B, like that's probably far more common than like this Amazon example, where it's just like, you just end up building a good company that can continue to execute at like a fast pace and like knowing the customer deeply. And, you know, I think you've got moats like brand, you got moats like community and you got distribution, um, you know, and we want to have all of those. We also want to keep developing like strong product and like tech moats too. So I think at some level that means just um, we've got to have a continually improving product and we've got to, you know, some point you end up having so much kind of product built. It's maybe none of it's hard to build. It's just, it would be hard to build all of it. 
And by the time you built all of it, your competitor, like I'd be gone too. Um, but I think, you know, when it comes to like our AI, you know, yeah, there, there there's a ton of different you know, differentiation just around the models that you use. And you know, we want to be really nimble. You know, we're always building in such a way that we can replace everything like wholesale, like very, very quickly. Um, I think a lot of companies maybe are going to get stuck on like some old model or some old way of doing things. And like, that's going to be the death of them. We also realize that we've got like a really unique data set, you know, just that our customers, you know, are, are giving us and we're seeing how they use it. And they're generating all sorts of content that like nobody else in the world has. And like, you know, to the degree that we can use that to go and make models better, any model, open AIs, this new one that comes out, the new one that comes out tomorrow, like whatever, like we would be able to take that data set and like very, very quickly, you know, fine tune and train those models that to be great for our customers. It may not be great for anybody else's customers. It may not be great for any other use cases, uh, but it's what our customers want and we've got like an inside track there. And so all that being said, I think moats are, are something to be, to be worked towards. I think there's a lot of pieces i don't think jasper or almost any other company in b2b will live and die on like one like perfect moat it'd be a combination of like six seven eight you know different things that make it hard to do it all together and i guess from a from a technical perspective are there things that you do to stay on top of the sort of generative generative ai space broadly i'd be curious you about thought but you know i mean I see a lot of it on Twitter, to be honest, you know, it's like, it's, where do you go for like in breaking information every 10 minutes? You know, it's like, it's Twitter, you know, by the time it makes it into like some newsletter roundup, it's like, you know, that stuff's obsolete now. So, you know, a lot yeah. of it's just kind of finding it and curating like a good Twitter list of people that are just in the know and, and all of that. Uh, I think, yeah, just conversations with like other founders, you know, like yourself or, you know, other stuff like that. Like I hear a ton there. Um, it feels like the, it feels like the only way to like stay up to date is to like really get all the way in, um, because like no one's going to like curate it and spoon feed it to you. Uh, and by the time they do, it'll be, you'll have kind of missed it. Oh yeah. What do you think, Sad? Yeah. So, you know, like before I started at Jasper, I, I called up like one of my mentors because I like, ran like a bunch of R and D laboratories and like, you know, just research processes. And I was like, how do you do it? Like, how do you become a successful, yeah, successful R and D leader? And he was like, well, you're probably never going to beat everybody else in the world at like everything. Cause like you have the whole world and they're all researching, they're coming up with the best stuff. So he's like, definitely stay on top of that, but like make, make that like a small percentage of a focus and then find the one thing that you can be the best in the world at. And like, as Dave said, like we have, like, we want to be like the most customer obsessed company, you know? Um, we want to like understand what we can do with customer data. Uh, we, you know, it, it'd be great if a customer could say like, I thought it and Jasper, and Jasper got it. Like they go from their idea to something that's in their hands, like some content created, like in the fastest, easiest way possible. And so I think that that customer data, being able to being able to take the best of like the world's R and D and saying, hey, like coming up with this new model that can be fine in, in this many ways. You you have these new prompting techniques. You have these new, uh, you know, base models or methods to like, uh, you know, like um, uh, hook on an adapter models to get better outputs. So if you want to take all of that, but then the one big thing we want to do is is find a way to use our customer data to get more customer fit. I think. Um, and that's a big deal. You know, like I said, models are either going to get semantically more complex or they're better at like domain fit. So I think that's almost the second axis, the whole second axis that we can be the best in the world at. Yeah. And I guess from like a hiring perspective, do you actually try to hire experts on generative AI? Is that even possible? Would, it, would anyone pass that bar at, at this point? So, so, you know, it just goes back to this word of like, what does expertise mean? Like the paper on transformers came out in 2017, like, and we've got, we've gotten like tons of amazing applicants who have like a lot of AI experience. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I think that's the question, like, is there an expert in, in generative AI? Like we're all running these things together. Um, even the R and D centers, like the, these world-class folks that come up with a model, like they don't even know what the model can really do until they test it. Um, I mean, it really is a black box and, and I don't think that this idea of like super explainable AI can apply to this field like su super quickly. So like, what does it mean to be an expert? I think what we're looking at is like, what we're looking for is like people who are obsessed with customers who are fantastic problem solvers, who are creative and like able to kind of navigate this uniquely interdisciplinary space. Like you have to be really good at the AI and the data science. You also have to be really good at like language and you have to like love the customer. And it's a pretty rare mix. It's like, um, it, it, you know, like, it's like the it's like the book by Walter Isaacson, like innovators, like the people who are good at the art, good at the science, and they have like that customer obsession. 
So I think those are probably like the three right ingredients. And we've been lucky to get some really great candidates, you know, along that line. And I think it makes the space uniquely interesting. Like it's definitely not boring. Yeah, we want to have a pretty diverse, a diverse set of experiences there because like you just got to be tapped in broadly. I mean, I said this earlier, but I think it's worth saying again, like I have never worked particularly well with people that come in like in an interview or something say, I really want to use this technology. I really want to use Terraform or, you know, whenever it is, yeah. it's just like, man, you know, I just, I don't know. It's just never worked out. It tends to be, Hey, we're, we got this hammer. We're just walking up looking for nails all the time instead of just realizing, Oh my gosh, like a screwdriver would have done it, you know, so much simpler, so much faster there. And so, you know, we, we, we tend to shy away from folks that like just want to do some cool technology. Um, but if they get excited about that as a, as a way to solve a problem, then that's huge. That's, that's actually a super good point, Dave, too. Like, uh, but like we've been talking a lot about fine tuning. You know, when people imagine fine tuning, you think about like the most complicated things first. There's, I don't know if this is like a trade secret or something, but there's actually like so many simple things you can do to get like major uplift. Um, and, and like, yeah, like that's crackiness. Like it, it goes a long way. Wait, wait, give me an example. You can't just, uh, you can't just say there's so many things. Like what's, what's the first thing you would, you would do? Uh, so, so, so for example, even with prompting, so like right now, when you think of prompting, you think of about you, maybe you think about a user putting in a prompt, or maybe you think about some backend prompting that like, that like, you know, like a template has, and then the user kind of interacts with that and then it sends it off. Um, I mean, just like a simple thing too, like if you have like a store of like what you can call context, like a series of pieces of information that the customer cares about, it could be like their voice, it could be, um, it could be like a list of their products. It could be uh, like their their customer's voice. It could be an example of like a customer review that somebody left them and, and was like really good. It could be a speech that maybe one of the leaders gave. Um, you could actually just contact up like various pieces of context and then have a prompt and then get like a really cool, like if you think of the generative model as like a remixer, remix these various pieces of context and give me something new. It actually works really well. And like, it's nothing super fancy. It's like, you know, fine tuning the model. You're just like doing really clever prompting. That has, you know, like I was, I was showing our, our, our business dev guy, our business pod leader, and he's been like really impressed with it. It's just like this, like these like little hacks. There's like thousands of these things. Or like even to simplify it, even this is Dave level. Like, let's say I wanted to make our like paragraph generator 10% better. Maybe measured by, it gets copied to clipboard 10% more often. Like there's obviously a bunch of ways to do that. You know, one way that somebody that really wants to do AI, you know, would probably come to me and they'd say, oh, you know, we got this T5 thing and we're going to spin up our own infrastructure and you know, all of this stuff. It'd probably take a month and a half and, you know, but like, we'll get this thing and we'll fine tune it on our past customer data. Yada, yada. You do all that and like, whatever, it probably, it could probably work. You could also, for us, you know, we got this built in the way that non-technical people can do it. I could go adjust the temperature from 0.7 to 0.4, and we might find that, holy cow, that actually produces way better paragraphs, and nobody had ever even thought to test it, and that takes six minutes. Now, you know, the customer gets the 10% improvement either way. Like, did they care about the, the T5 version? I think that's so cool and so amazing and awesome. Like, no, they're just like 10% better. I'll just take whatever one, you know, you give me. I'm trying to write this blog post so I can get home to my kid's baseball game. So I think, like, we're kind of always pushing ourselves to be like, like, what we care about is the lift. Like, what's the, like, what are all the ways we could do that? Like, let's start with the simplest one first, as opposed to just playing startup or playing AI or doing just whatever new cool white paper came out yesterday. Yeah, and it's right. and just like 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 we're fun that even a little bit more, like it's actually it's actually really surprising sometimes too. Like, um, like we we did this experiment where we actually we had two models and we actually thought like let's just say model A and model B. We thought model A was going to win because it was a better and more sided and complex and all that type of stuff. But our customers like model B better, and like we you know we thought about like why like B was like a little bit more wordy, more flowery. So if like you're an English teacher, you wouldn't have liked that. But like, you know, you like model A, but but our customers really like model B way better. And so it kind of like dawned upon us that like the customers were using the content outputs, much like a sculptor like looks at like a big rock. Like they're actually trying to like get something that's easy for them to like delete from rather than something perfect that they want to add to. And, and you know, I, I think it's like the models are complicated. It's really interesting, but like the customer is also very interesting. And like we don't fully understand exactly what they want and what they like either. So so being able to focus on that using these hacks like is a way to just understand the customer better, like faster too. When you think about your like R and D budget today is it more like 
ninety percent prompt engineering and and ten percent you know kind of machine learning and fine tuning and this fancy stuff, or is it more like ninety percent fancy stuff and ten percent prompt engineering, or like how would you how would you describe um, where you put your investments right now? So, so you know, I do view them like kind of tied together, but like like for us, it hasn't been like such a big divide. Like we we'll get the new model or we'll like come up with a new you know, adapters for a situation. And um, we then have a black box. And like, the question is, will this black box be better for our customers, the same or worse? And then we, we you know, we, we we definitely put it into like an A-B experimentation kind of situation. And we start running it through numbers of tests. These tests can involve different prompts. It can involve, you know, like different different configurations. Um, and we have like a bunch of internal metrics we're running against too. Everything really just represents our hypotheses where we think the customer will like more. Like, will they like more varied sentence structures, more longer, you know, longer stuff, whether like something that's more on topic or, or, or something, you know, so on. Um, so I think it's all like a part of the toolkit. Um, and like the right percentage is the one that results in the biggest uplift fastest. So I'm sure it'll always be moving around. Um, prompt engineering plays a huge role right now, but like we know that a lot of customers have asked for more domain specificity. So that's an area of research where a lot of R&D budget is going to. But once you overcome this like initial hump, then maybe we'll go back to prompt engineering again. Yeah, it's probably less prompt engineering you know as a percentage then you know you probably think i don't know less than 50 percent maybe maybe a lot less yeah i don't know you know and i think there's definitely some like diminishing returns or like you play around with that stuff and you get some great gains and you know you keep trying and you can't really get anything else to like really break through there so one thing here gets you pretty far pretty fast um but at some point you've got to do the uh a lot of the outside stuff to just keep getting big improvements yeah. Is it hard as you scale to kind of institutionalize the the things that you're learning? Like I, I picture your company running all these different experiments, do all these different things to make customers happy, but does like every new hire have to kind of come in and, you know, learn on their own, all these things? Like how do you kind of keep track of all these, you know, insights that that, that you're having? That is a challenge, you know, and I think so much of, of, what I try to do all day and just, you know, and just for context, when I mean, we've got 10 people at the beginning of the year to 150 people now. Wow. That's um, incredible. So it's a ton of just, you know, you're, you're trying to find somebody that knows what happened three months ago and you ask 10 people and you, know, you can't find anyone that was even here. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I think that's been, that's been a lot um, of the work and just trying to like give people context over and over and try to point people to like past things that were done or past experiments that worked. And luckily, I mean, Slack is like a pretty good, you know, record for a lot of that. We've got this like channel that's like a, a, a shipped channel. Anytime something gets shipped to customers, they'll go in there. So you kind of learn a lot just by scrolling back through that and seeing all the different winning A-B tests. You know, we always publish that. Yeah, you know, we'll even try to write that in a way that's like customer facing just to like fully wrap your head around like, what are we trying to do here? Like, like put it in a way that the customer would appreciate. Don't just talk about latency. You know, talk about like, man, now customers can generate, you know, 18% faster and yada, yada, yada. So yeah, I think a lot of us just kind of should really call people back to like the past, like what we've done and like aggregate that in kind of best ways that we can. But we have not found like a really easy way or like a, we don't have like a super cool training course on like, you know, all the insights that we've had. Um, I think we're getting better at trying to like aggregate those and like make sure the right people have them. And I know how you feel about this, Dave, like, like, I think like, rem like remoteness has like a lot of benefits and has a lot of challenges as well. Like, I think a lot of folks pre-COVID are used to just getting into a team room and like doing, you know, having a sprint and like you kind of learn through that sprint. It's a little bit more, it's just different, like in a remote setting. So I think just the world is getting used to like, how do you apprentice like in a remote setting? Um, we definitely try to like simulate that with offsites and like getting to meet the team. But, um, but, but I think, I'm not saying it's like a challenge, but it's definitely something like we're learning about as we go. Yeah, you guys fully remote, Lucas? We're basically fully um, remote. We do have a headquarters in San Francisco, but um, our meetings are generally remote first and we'll hire people in any, any geography. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I definitely think like going like from 10 to 150 would be easier in person. Um, but that doesn't mean that like the fullness of the company, like I think that there's outsized benefits you know over a long enough time horizon to be in remote but it definitely feels like this early like forming phase trying to get knowledge in the right spot like it's tough remote i think and uh yeah the initial team 
was all like in the same room and you know i don't i don't think we probably would have uh, i think it'd be very hard to find product market fit and have the year we did kind of out of the gate if we were all just you know remote at that time yeah i guess on my end i've kind of appreciated some of the discipline that remote uh work forces you to do like i think we write a lot more down and and we keep you know better agendas and records and things like that so for me it, it hasn't been all bad but i think there's so many different you know, ways to run a company. And I think different teams, even some prefer to do lots of on-sites and some don't care at all. And so. Yeah. Um, no, I do love, I do love that force you to just think more clearly, communicate more clearly, like plan ahead. So you're not just always putting out fire stuff today. Like I really think it does do some really good stuff there. I'm curious, you know, you're, you're, we don't intentionally try to invite, you know, only customers on the podcast, but I think in the end, we typically are talking to people that are customers usually and, and you guys actually aren't a, a customer of, of weights and biases and i kind of wonder do you feel like if you were in my shoes would you be worried like do you feel like there's this big trend happening that sort of undercuts what what weights and biases does i think Sad, you're probably more familiar with with what we do so maybe i'll let you um answer that question and i promise i won't be offended with any uh direction you want to take that yeah so first of all weights and biases is a great company a lot a lot of like you know friends are there now uh um, so, and, and, you know, and just thank you for inviting us, even though we're not customers. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like weights and biases, it increases in value as the, as the customer has like more and more models. Like it's essentially like a thing that scales in value as the number of model scales. Is that right? I think that's, I think that's what customers tell us. Yeah, for sure. So, so, so like, you know. I guess it drays a lot in terms of how this like generative AI space will kind of shape up, but um, I can see some companies developing in this space that are like like mono model companies. Like they just have their one model and they're specializing that one model and like it's, it's use cases. So like obviously for that that'd be a challenge. I can see other companies though that they have like maybe a few big base models. And these things are pretty huge. Like you don't want to be fine tuning a you know a multi you know hundred billion dollar or hundred billion parameter model like all the time unnecessarily. But maybe these maybe these companies have maybe like two, three, four bigger models, but they have like tons of adapter models, or they have like some small models used for different things. I can see weights and biases being ultra useful for that. So I think overall, you know, answer your question is no, it'll still continue to be really useful. Um, um, I think like how people think about scaling models and when's that, you know, when and how is it viable though, that might change. And I think we're we're still learning what the best architectures are that'll sustain in the space. Okay, well, you know, usually with the the nerds that we have on this show, we end uh, with with two questions. I might slightly modify it uh, for you guys because I have a slightly different version that I want to ask you. So typically we ask, you know, if you had more time to research a different topic in machine learning, um, what would that be? But I, I want to ask you all, if you had like a different domain that you think these models might apply phenomenally well to where there's no one like you who's kind of come in with um, that like sort of like customer empathy like what do you think is like ripe for disruption with these um disruption with these generative models i think about this a lot and i think we've seen you know we just did our big series a announcement like there's probably just like an army of like clones like you know gaining strength in the corners of the universe right now that like will all pop up in the next you know two months and they'll be just very much like jasper and you know probably good products and all that like that's a bad way to do it it's like you don't want to compete. You like you don't want to compete against us at like our game. It's like we have to be really good at our game, but like we have one out of a million games. And I think like what I would encourage people to do is like this could be done anywhere, and you could take this and put it in any subset of any industry. You could do you know legal stuff. You could do stuff for doctors. You could do stuff for different teams and companies. You could do stuff for. You know, if you think about like CRMs now, like CRMs, like over like, over like 20 years, like I've got a friend that just started a cleaning company, like a local cleaning company. And he was like, it's so easy to start. It's like, there's this CRM that just like does everything for you. And I was like, what was it? HubSpot or Salesforce? It's like, ah, no, it's like, it's like some rando thing I've never heard of in my life. That's like a big company that like just a CRM for cleaning companies. <laughs> And it's like, like, that's like where this goes to is like, you know, you, you take your end user, you understand them deeply, you take all the noise, you simplify it for them and you get them a product that just does what they're trying to do better. And like, you know, anyone could, could beat Jasper by like going deeper in any like little vertical that like, we're not like 
fully focused on there. Anyone could could do better at something that's a little bit more specific. Um, and this is true, I guess, of like models too. You know, it's like you know, you could get you know a, a better model if it was just more specific there. So that's kind of be my encouragement to people, and maybe just like the community at large. It's like this is all like so cool, but like there's there's so many people that would be thrilled to use this technology if you would just kind of package it up for them. Um, and I think the key is to not like try and be the next Jasper, you know, do exactly what we do. It's like, take like the essence of it and then go for like a different customer segment. And like, there's so much, there's so much opportunity out there right now. That's just completely untouched. Uh, and nobody has tried to build for, and like you go find a community and do that. Like you'll be in really good shape. But do you mean like making marketing copy for lawyers or do you mean like doing some kind of specific other thing for for lawyers when when you say that i mean it could be any i mean i i don't think marketing copy as much you know i'm thinking you know well i mean one i would just want to talk to lawyers so like hey like can you tell me about like what you write all day like that's where i would start so i mean i'm not a lawyer uh you know i'm guessing it's a lot of you know explaining in short form to customers over email what that document means you know and you can just build a quick summarizer you know that just hooks into gmail and you know spits that out you know really fast it could be you know you training up paralegals to understand more stuff so you build a little tool that helps them kind of synthesize you know documents you know and explain it to just train up people internally it could be generating some boiler point or boilerplate content that uh you know maybe i talked to a, a, a lawyer and I say, hey, show me how you like put together a document. Maybe it's a lot of them going to Google and searching for boilerplate stuff and then added it. Maybe similar to how like, you know, engineers, you know, write code a lot of it's kind of watch them go to Stack Overflow and copy and paste, you know, and now kind of Codex or whatever's like framed all that up. So like again, I don't know because I haven't spent the time in there, but it's like that I, I think there's probably a ton of opportunity that like I would never even think of. But if you just spend time with like that uh, group of people, you know, you could really, you'd see a lot of opportunity to do a lot of things because you'd be like, oh my gosh, like this model from two years ago does that out of the box. Like we'll just spin that up for you. That's more of what I'm talking than like thinking, oh, like marketing copy for this niche there. Well, one quick thought here, and is this kind of a funny point? So like I, I try to read like all of Jasper's churn notes, like who's leaving Jasper and like why. And there's like a funny demographic of like students like who use Jasper, <laughs> but like and, and like maybe they're using it to do their homework. I, I'm not sure exactly. I think I, I think some of them are. Um, so that combined with another insight of like the, the education sector is like one of the hardest sectors. Like it's so hard to innovate in education, and, you know, especially technology wise. This is less like that. I think it's a good idea, and it's more of just like, you know, just sending good vibes to whoever ever tries to use generative AI in education. Like students seem to be using generative AI to to like do different things for like their assignments and homework. I think it'd be really interesting if like somebody did like a Taekwondo move and like took like some of the capabilities generated by that would make a student want to use it, you know, like maybe for like something that's kind of like cheating, like they're doing their you know, English essay on a generative AI app, but like actually combining that with like pedagogy. So they're actually still learning like through that. Um, super hard to do these sort of startups, but like, uh, you know, like w- wouldn't it be cool if you could do like procedurally generated like lessons for for students like just kind of using this and kind of making it really fun it's a hard space you know i'm not saying it's going to be the next like you know quarter or anything like that but like if somebody can succeed at using this in education i mean that's just it's just like impressive if somebody pulled that off it's cool all right well final question um we usually ask what's the hard part about making machine learning models work in the real world but, but maybe for you i'm just sort of curious more broadly kind of making this company, making this product that that people appreciate so much, what's something unexpectedly challenging about making it work? So, um, you know, I, I think it just goes back to this insight that like people are more complicated than AI. <laughs> and, and, and like what their user, what their UX preferences are, how they want to use it, how to simplify it for them. Um, you know, like like solving the black box of AI is probably like thousands, maybe like tens of thousands of permutations, but solving like the right design for the human, there's like infinite amounts of permutations for that. So yeah, you know, it's, this is new for everybody. And like, we're still learning how people use this. Like, like even I was just, maybe, maybe it's obvious to, to Dave and everybody else. But like, I was like really surprised to like realize that customers want a lot of text that then they want to delete it and find like the gem inside of that boulder. Um, I just, I just don't write like that, but it was fascinating to see that's what our customers do. This probably would be like a thousand other things we learned about people and how they use generative AI. 
um, like it's infinite what, what we can learn about people and how they want to use this. So I think it's like, it's like, it's hard, but like inspiring at the same time. I was thinking something that's hard. This is a step off of the actual tech, but it's like the community aspect of it. You know, I mean, arguably like our community has been like one of our biggest advantages. So we've got customers with tattoos and, you know, we're just all riffing in there. It's just a lot of fun, but it's like, man, it's, it's exhausting. And like, you know, I've had the whole community turn on me, you know, and like all of a sudden like the answer is blowing up and like, people are pissed, people are canceling, leaving. It's like, you know, I'm the bad guy. You know, I've got to go in there and like say that. And it's like, it's, it's emotionally challenging to be connected to people in like such a, you know, meaningful or powerful or exciting kind of way. And, uh, and it's work. I mean, there's times that I like really have to like, you know, get hyped up to like, oh, I'm going to go and like kind of do this. Um, but it's like, to me, it just feels like table stakes. And if, if you're not willing to do that, you know, it's okay. Like, like maybe like fi- find a customer base that you would be willing to do that with. Um, because like, it's such a valuable part of the game, of just building a company and, and building great products that like, if you find yourself, uh, avoiding or, you know, not wanting to be spend time with your customers, then it's just gonna be so hard to do the rest of it there. So communities are, are a lot of fun and, you know, high, high stakes, uh, so fun when they're going really well, so miserable when they're not going well. Um, but it's, it's, it's really, really worth it. And I think, yeah, the, the benefits are immense. You know, it's funny, Dave, the, the stock entrepreneurship advice that I always give people, and I haven't heard anyone else say it, is exactly what you said, which is find a customer that you like because you have to spend so much time with them and you'll just be so much happier. And it's funny, I think, totally. I think both, of our, both of our companies, we've had the identical approach of just sort of like approaching a really specific customer type with like a clean sheet of paper of like, hey, you know, what do you need? So it's it's interesting to to learn that from this uh this interview and, and i mean congrats on on such a vibrant community and, and such a well-loved product that's so so cool yeah but no. do you want to brag about any any stats i mean everyone says you know jasper is like one of the fastest growing companies of all time is there any uh numbers that you make public that you'd want to yeah i think it was public you know i think what got public was uh you know year one by the end of the year we got the 35 million arr and we only had like nine people, um, I think at the end of the year that we're doing that. And uh, pretty good. Don't tell my investors about that, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> no, it was it was pretty good. And it was like, you know, it's a mix of luck and a mix of right time, right place, and the right team. And you know, that's one of those like early, you know, eye popping things. And I think like two months into it, we added like a little over three million in ARR in, in like three a three day period. I went oh my God. like new product. And it was just, I mean, I was just like hyperventilating, like, oh my God, like, I cannot believe this. I've stood my whole life failing. And you, know, you finally kind of hit one. And so, no, man, I think we're, uh, I am just as, as shocked and grateful, you know, to kind of be a part of this as, uh, as, you know, the next person. And, you know, I, I think, I think, yeah, it's been a, a wild ride and we're trying to just stay humble and stay focused. And, you know, for the first year, we didn't hire anybody. We didn't have any meetings. We didn't do any investor call. Like it was just like so simple, like almost this like garden of Eden of like startups. So just like us hanging out with our customers like all the time and like trying to build some stuff that they wanted. And uh, and that really worked. So I think, yeah, as we scale, like we're trying to just like keep that ethos, you know, and infuse that throughout the rest of the company because um, there's something nice about simplicity and uh, it's something essential about simplicity as you scale. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much. Super fun interview. I yeah, really you bet, it. man. Appreciate you having us on. This has been so fun. Yeah, thanks for having us. If you're enjoying these interviews and you want to learn more, please click on the link to the show notes in the description where you can find links to all the papers that are mentioned, supplemental material, and a transcription that we worked really hard to produce. So check it out.